Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Thursday, June 2nd, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Affordable Care Act? Health insurer seeks a 60% increase. After that, the EU proposes an internet ID. And when good teleprompters go bad, that's next. If we turn against each other based on divisions of race or religion, if we fall for, you know, a, a bunch of okie doke <laughs> just because it, it, you know, it, it, it uh, you know, it, 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 it sounds funny or the tweets are. Four Syrian refugees have been caught plotting a massive Paris-style terror attack for Germany. Now, these were four men who planned to besiege the historic city center of Dusseldorf. They were going to launch a Paris-style massacre involving suicide bombs, targeting a street there with a lot of public transportation, uh, including tram stations. So German federal prosecutors have confirmed that three Syrian nationals have been arrested and their homes searched, while a further warrant has been issued for a young man who was currently under arrest in France. Now, this plot was discovered when that man, Salah A, gave himself up to the French security authorities, so he's now being held there uh, and under arrest. Um, two of these men received their orders from ISIS to carry out this plot. They arrived uh, to Turkey from Syria in 2014, and they were waiting to take advantage of this migrant surge pouring into Europe. They got there in 2015. They met with an explosives expert who was sent to Germany in 2014 by ISIS. And so this is something that's been going on clearly for a few years. As we reported, there was an Islamic State uh, manifesto released in December where they were bragging about the fact that they were exploiting uh, this refugee crisis since at least 2012. And that that was their plan was to flood the country with millions of people, millions of refugees. It would be too much to handle and that they would hide jihadists within. And now we are seeing that indeed this is what is coming to pass. And uh, one of these really dangerous migrant smuggling routes is flourishing in lawless Libya. Now, authorities there, the officials have been able to block some of the crossings uh, that people were taking to, to Greece. But now they're looking for ways to shut down flows on the other major sea route into the EU from Libya. So there were efforts really going on to try to counter people trafficking, but they were thrown completely into disarray by the conflict following uh, Libya's up, uh, the people's uprising there in 2011. So as we can see, there was just this massive destabilization that went on. Uh, now, years later, we're seeing the effects of that uh, area being destabilized in the Middle East, which is, of course, one of Clinton's big successes, Hillary Clinton's big successes there, destabilizing the Middle East. And now, for whatever reason, she is going to be using her record as a neocon warmonger to attack Donald Trump. And so this is exactly what she did today in her foreign policy speech. Uh, she was arguing that Trump's skepticism on military intervention is going to be a threat to U.S. foreign policy and indeed a threat to the world order that she herself has helped to implement. Uh, the New York Times reported that the speech was going to specifically criticize Trump's remarks on NATO and his proposal that Japan, South Korea, and Saudi Arabia pay for their own defense. And indeed, she did talk about that today and how they were going to be testing uh, some of their nuclear, anti-nuclear weaponry this weekend. And they could only do that because they're allies. And why would Trump want to disrupt uh, any of our allies, any of our relationships that we have with allies? We have two friendly uh, countries on either border with us. Why would you want to disrupt that? So she's really attacking him. But Kurt Nimmo kind of really breaks it down as far as let's look at this neocon warmongering record that Hillary Clinton is so proud of that she's going to attack Trump saying he doesn't know what he's doing. Does she know what she's doing unless her plan is to absolutely destabilize regions? So let's talk about uh, Afghanistan. Obama said he was going to withdraw all the troops. Well, Clinton backed a major escalation of the conflict in Afghanistan. She encouraged Obama to send between 30,000 and 100,000 additional troops this was her, along with Defense Secretary Robert Gates and CIA Director David Petraeus. They pushed for the Afghan surge. 
74% of U.S. casualties uh, there happened after that. Uh, she's also uh, voted for the illegal invasion of Iraq in October 2002. Uh, she, in public, she claimed to be against uh, keeping uh, forces there, but she privately encouraged it. She proposed spending approximately $3 billion to hire 5,100 private security co contractors to remain and fight in Iraq. Uh, the mercenary force was described as a State Department private army. And despite 70% of the American public opposing U.S. military action in Syria, Clinton pressured Obama to arm the anti-Assad rebels, who, of course, as we've reported many, many times, are Islamic State and Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists. So she encouraged the president to arm them, and she also endorsed airstrikes on the Syrian government. So that's, of course, uh, resulted in prolonging the conflict. So we're basically in a U.S. proxy war right now. And, um, I mean, it just goes on and on. She backed the coup, military coup in Honduras. So a lot of people are just wondering if this reckless interventionism is going to hurt her with voters. Probably it will not, because, indeed, even her private server fiasco doesn't seem to be really hurting her as far as the Democratic Party is concerned. They're still pushing her as their future president, the first female president, even though it's kind of neck and neck there with Bernie Sanders, who knows what's going to happen after California uh, next week. Now, Edward Snowden tweeted out something just excellent right to the point. He talked about how if you expose uh, state secrets for the benefit of the world, you could be exiled. If you expose state secrets for your own personal reasons, you could become the next president here in the U.S., so let's find out why Judge Napolitano thinks Hillary is absolutely incompetent. And this is new information to me because I'm kind of like, I look at her server fiasco and I think, what else could there be? Well, now Clinton's chief of staff, while Secretary of State Cheryl Mills revealed in deposition that Clinton exclusively used a BlackBerry, not a laptop, desktop or a tablet to communicate electronically. Well, what's the problem with that? Napolitano explains that this BlackBerry was her BlackBerry not a government-issued BlackBerry. So what does that mean? Because it wasn't government-issued, it was blocked on the seventh floor of the State Department. That's where her office is. So that means whenever she was in her office, she didn't have the means to communicate electronically to people that she had all around the world for the entire time that she was there. So what she would do is she would take a security team, go from the seventh floor to the sixth floor where her personal BlackBerry worked. So she has ambassadors all over the world trying to communicate with her and she cuts herself off. Or, you know, if you're there in Benghazi, she just takes a nap, goes to sleep because she's so tired. And he also uh, points out that absolutely, indeed, 100 percent of her emails were taken away from the government server and run through her private server to circumvent the Freedom of Information Act. And a lot of these other emails that she apparently did not turn over to the State Department revealed that indeed she didn't want her private emails commingling and getting seen by the State Department. Just what were you up to, Hillary Clinton? Nobody cares about your yoga poses or your wedding plans. So she is a criminal warmonger, of course, really, really good at circumventing uh, the Freedom of Information Act and, you know, destabilizing the Middle East. So she should really tout that record and run on that. Now, it's not just Clinton, but Obama, too, who are rolling out this Trump isn't qualified. He doesn't know what he's doing. And so we're really seeing this concerted effort now. Uh, let's take a look at how the president totally malfunctioned on stage. If we turn against each other based on divisions of race or religion, if we fall for, you know, a, a bunch of okie doke just because it, it you know, it, it uh, you know, it, 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 it sounds funny or. So first of all, what is he even talking about? Racial tensions have actually exploded in this country since he's been president. And don't tell me it's because of racist white people, because it was the majority of white people who voted for him twice. So that was your bad. But one of his huge accomplishments, of course, is the Affordable Care Act which of course is now becoming even more unaffordable every single year. Now, uh, Texas' largest health insurance provider has announced in a statement yesterday, this is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas, 
they're going to raise their rates by as much as 60% in 2017. So this is going to completely enrage people. It's getting super expensive. And they say that the reason why they're having to do this is to account for lower than hoped enrollment, sicker than expected customers, and problems with the government's financial backstop for the insurance markets. The company says it's lost over a billion dollars. Man, well, I hate to say I told you so, but you know who else just cannot help himself and had to say I told you so is Donald Trump, who, of course, tweeted about that immediately, that people are panicking and they're very angry, angry because health care costs are exploding. Of course, Trump has a pretty good answer to this whole Obamacare debacle. Check it out on his website. Everyone's always saying, well, what's his plan? What's he going to do? Uh, but back to this whole race racism thing. Now we've got a professor coming out saying that it's the racist Trump supporters who are a bigger domestic terror threat than jihadists. This is George Mason University adjunct professor David Alfer. And he's calling the right wing worse than Islamists and that it's racist Donald Trump supporters. Uh, they're blaming the growing physical violence at Trump rallies on backlash against an increasingly diverse and progressive American society. So clearly he is has no concept of reality. Reality be damned because the violence scene has almost exclusively been carried out by anti-Trump agitators, as we've shown you in many, many videos. But let's take a look at some of the best of this week in California with some of our pro-Trump supporters. Let's see how bad they really are. Michael Zimmerman for InfoWars.com. We are here at the Donald Trump rally in Sacramento, California, here at the Sacramento International Jet Center. And they are full. They are absolutely packed to capacity right before the start of the rally. There are 9,600 people inside with hundreds more outside waiting to get in. Just a huge turnout. There's not very many protesters here potentially because there's not very much parking for them or, or it's more difficult for them to get here, or the protesters of Sacramento are just very low energy. But we've talked to a lot of people out here today, Trump supporters, some protesters who have uh, some pretty dumb arguments. And as you can see, there are definitely lots of people coming out today to support Donald Trump. So what do you think of some of these protesters who have shown up here today? Uh, you know, I don't think of them at all, so I really don't even see them. <laughs> Um, I'm just here focused on what I came to do, and that's to focus uh, on Donald Trump and support him and let my voice be heard, and yeah. Yeah, the only people I've heard that have been particularly nasty are the, you know, people, you know, here harassing everyone in line. You know, I haven't heard any of the Trump supporters really say anything nasty back, but it's just, you know, harassing people, you know? Yeah, you know, I don't even pay them attention. I just pray for them. And, you know, like AJ said, you know, we got to run them over, keep it pushing. You know, right now it's very important that, you know, people who have a, a piece of a brain to get their head in the game and, you know, vote with their dollars. And get yeah, we're, we're at a very critical time for this country and, you know, people need to need to make a choice. Yeah, we don't have time to be divided right now, you know, and um, I mean, everybody else have borders. Why can't we? So. You know, I'm just, I'm Trump 2016 all the way. I'm not saying that he's going to be the one president to get it all fixed, but he's a start, so. And I happen to know that, you know, these Mexican people get pissed off because we're, you know, we want to build a wall. But yet, when the Central Americans, the Peruvians, they try to cross over their border, they shoot them all. They don't play games. They don't, they don't, you know, they don't put you in a detention center. The detention center is 50 feet on the ground. Then they hide their bodies and stuff. People disappear. Exactly. Everybody should have a wall. Everybody. Europe, everybody should have a wall. We wouldn't be in this state if, you know, if everybody had one. be in San Jose and I know so Trump's gotten a lot of heat in the past from the Latino community. Why do you think that is and why do you support him? Because the liberal media lies and they're asleep. They, they're misinformed and they need they need to be informed. That's, that's, that's all it is. Simple as that. All right and how about when you saw him in person how did those hands look? Were they small? I didn't notice. Nah they're pretty big. I didn't, I, were they? Yeah. All I right. didn't notice. That's long all right. I was paying attention to what was coming out of his face. Yeah. I liked all that. He's just like a normal right. guy, man. I just yeah. felt like he was a normal guy, just like you, him. Yeah. Go. If, you, if you talk to him personally. Outside, you know, good guy. Just, just like that. He's going to fix it all, yeah. man. All right, thank you guys. Have a good one. Thank Infowars.com, we're here at the Sacramento Jet Center where Donald Trump just spoke and we've got two very excited supporters here. Uh, there's there's some protesters kind of arguing with people still. 
But so what did y'all guys think of the rally? I thought it was like all inspiring like I'm actually watching history like even if he doesn't which I hope he does he's gonna we're gonna say Donald Trump came to Sacramento and I got to see him and that's what's really exciting for me being a first time voter this is my first election you know me being a US soldier in the National Guard for California to be honest no better candidate man straight up it's just when he speaks and the crowd yells the way they do it hits you in a certain way it's just unbelievable yeah, Trump doesn't just talk about loving and supporting our veterans oh, he shows it he shows it 5.6 million dollars almost six million dollars in only a couple of hours things Hillary and Bernie couldn't do in years it's great do you, do you realize what's going on in, in Germany and Sweden and Europe wrong. right now that's wrong that's do you dead realize wrong. what's going on that's now dead wrong and they have the same fascist extremist ideals going on in Germany all over Europe it's dead wrong well, do you know, you know what it's you know caused by it's caused by desperation of do, white people no, 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 check people are afraid <laughs> Listen to this, man, because you said... Okay, like, so you understand what's going on in Europe. Sweden right now is entertaining the idea of making a female-only pools because they can't control the amount of rapes that are going on. Well, my guest today is Ella Grace. She's the author of the book America is Infected. Now, this book details uh, the true story, something you experienced, and it's highly controversial because it details the fight that you had, not only trying to fight against the medical system, um, to diagnose a mystery illness, but also then against the court system who try to take your child away because they, they didn't appreciate the fact that you were willing to fight for your son and not just accept the doctor's misdiagnosis. Yes, absolutely. It's been a nightmare. Thankfully, we're coming to a close. And uh, it started back in 2010 when my son got a strep infection. Um, he came down with serious psychiatric symptoms. Um, auditory hallucinations, he felt like bugs were crawling on him, he had acute OCD, he was in the corner, he was terrified, something was wrong. We continued to call the pediatrician, no, we don't, you know, that wouldn't happen. What's well, happening? I'm, I'm watching it happen. Mm. And so basically on the third day, there was another pediatrician that had answered the phone. He said, this sounds like an acute onset of pandas. Well, I didn't know what that was. I mean, a, a panda bear. So uh, I Googled it real quick and I found that it was an autoimmune disease of the brain. I didn't know that it was controversial and that there was all sorts of stigma associated with it because it had just recently been identified that summer. So when I go to the emergency room, I'm like, oh, my son has pandas. And then I guess that sent up all kinds of red flags and um, should have had a lawyer with me that day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ultimately though, he was admitted and they did MRIs and did some various testing, and they did find one uh, inf major infection. His anti-DNA B titers were super high. So they treated him with antibiotics, and he got better. But when they discharged us, they wrote a prescription for Zoloft and told us to take him for cognitive behavioral therapy. That was the treatment at the time. And so we went along with it. We went to 30 therapy sessions, but it was always confusing to me is how would a psychiatric medication treat a streptococcal um, like a viral pathogenies. Yeah. yeah, it's like, what? So anyway, go with it, do what they say, right? We have to do what they say. Right. Everything that they say. And so we're being compliant, we're going every week, every week, a year later, this thing happens again but this time it's in his gut and it's just like he's writhing in pain. I'm like, okay, this is not, therapy is not the right treatment for this. So I call the therapist, I'm like, come to the house, you've got to see this. Even the therapist said, he needs to go back to the doctor for more medical rule outs. I'm like, I, I agree, go back to the doctor. I mean, it's like ring around the rosy. Where do you go? They don't know where to send you or they don't do the right follow up when they do send you, nobody has the records. Um, when I finally got to the conclusion, I did understand why, but when I was going through it at the time, it was extremely frustrating, and it was heart-wrenching to watch him go through this. Um, the same time, I was experiencing some symptoms myself, 
and they were tingling of the hands and feet. I was losing weight, grinding my teeth. I kept thinking it was the stress, the financial stress, losing my hair. It was just, I had a finger break that just wouldn't heal. I had to have two surgeries. It's like, what is wrong with me? But of course there was the recession and the financial strain and all the things that we hear cause all these physical symptoms, but still doesn't make much sense. So I end up on some psych meds myself for the anxiety and the sleep abnormality. And I end up getting nerve blocks because I get diagnosed with RSD. So we've got these two major mysterious illnesses going on in our home at the same time. I kind of tabled mine because it completely took the forefront in 2013 when he contracted a second strep infection. Theoretically, you would want to put a child with this diagnosis called PANDAS, on um, amoxicillin to prevent future strep pyogenes infections, similar to rheumatic fever. Uh, but our pediatrician didn't agree, and so he contracted a second one, which put him over, uh, over, over the charts. And it was so sad to watch. But uh, all the pressure from everyone around me, the schools, um, everyone else involved, you've got to be stricter, you've got to implement boundaries, it's your parenting, there's structure, there was a divorce, it's your fault. So at that point in time, I was like, you know what, this is not gonna be my fault. So I bought that James Lehman Total Transformation Flip Your Kids Around program, had my web guide make these two-ply tickets, we had a reward system, marbles, debit cards, took them on trips, reading night, it, anyway, it's still up and down, up and down the behaviors. I was like, okay, we can rule out the parenting issue. Right. And so it was just at that point in time, I didn't know what else to do. And he was just, he had ODD, oppositional defiance disorder, OCD, ADHD, rage. I was like, how is this possible with an infection? Mm -hmm. Unless infection is the cause of these things. Right. And so then it began to dawn on me why this might be so controversial. So at that point in time, we had to contact the juvenile court systems or they, we got entangled with them. They gave us a laundry list of rules that we had to comply with or I would go to jail. They threatened me with going to jail multiple times and we had to not let him do electronics. He couldn't hang out with friends. He lost his whole summer, all because he has this crazy mysterious autoimmune disease of the brain that nobody knew what to do with. Wow. We finally got the right test back. The psychiatrist actually ordered for us. Thank you, Dr. Asher. <laughs> and uh, it was positive. At that point in time, I went to the courts and I was like, okay, look, it's positive. There's a medical explanation for these behaviors. You would think. They didn't care a bit. Not one bit. Because you're already in the system now. In the system now. And in fact, I'm not sure if I can say this, but I will. Uh, during discovery, we found all types of secret emails back and forth between court officers, like little hateful comments. There was so many number of times they could have stepped in and helped us, like at least a hundred. Wow. But this went on and on. They kept on putting him back in the detention center, back in the detention center. Ultimately, we ended up in Maryland. He got IVIG because he was so advanced. He got steroids. Of course, the treatment makes him worse before they get better. Back in the detention center. But this time, the judge put him in there for five weeks because I think she was a little worried about a lawsuit. And so solitary confinement for five weeks. And now he, he at that point, developed PTSD in addition to the PANDAS. Wow. So dealing with all of these things. And that's, I mean, just that's crazy to me because all you're trying to do as a parent is figure out what's truly wrong with your child. You're there with them. You could see something is not right. It's not working. You're doing everything the system is telling you to do. And we're supposed to believe that them taking your child away is for the best interest of the child. They don't care. They don't what, care. What are you going to do with them that I haven't been doing with him? Right. We did the psych meds. You told us to do the psych meds. We tried the psych meds. They don't work. You know, when you have a flare, it's up and down. It depends on if you're exposed to an infection. A psychiatrist is not going to be able to pull someone on and off a psych med when they're exposed to an infection. So that's not the answer. Right. So ultimately, um, I mean, I was terrified that they were just going to keep putting him back in the detention center. They ultimately tried to take custody away from me. They took away my medical decision making. And um, those three months we spent just fighting for custody of him. That's when I found an amazing lawyer. And thank God for her because she was able to help me in that department. And then I was able to get him back. And when he came back, 
the IVIG, apparently he needed more than just the one treatment. But the guardian at litem interfered with the medical care with the insurance company, so we couldn't get that. Uh, so I had to figure out what autoimmune diseases were because I was like, okay, nothing's working. And so I just started researching and I started digging in deep. And I mean, probably several months of just reading, nothing makes sense. Immune systems just don't break on their own. I mean, how did we just all of a sudden wake up one day and everyone's immune system is malfunctioning? Right. There has to be something going on. And I didn't know what it was. So I went back to work at the spa and I just started asking clients. My clients are healthy clients. I mean, they're not obese, they're not sedentary, they work out all the time, they eat at Whole Foods, they do everything we're told to do. And they were chronically ill, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, kids with OCD, ADHD, families, and I started recognizing patterns. And so I just really felt like after being there for a while and watching this thing, whatever was happening was contagious. It was yeah. clearly contagious. Yeah, and now I uh, want you to kind of hold that thought right there because what you found out is just absolutely mind-blowing. There's a reason why you use your pen name and why this is highly controversial and why we're also seeing a lot of holistic doctors uh, winding up dead who were dealing with a lot of controversial things because what you discovered in just the path of being a passionate parent willing to do the digging um, it's just incredible, and I think we're going to get some answers for a lot of people out there dealing with mystery illnesses and just this explosion in all of these disorders. Mm -hmm. And welcome back. My guest is Ella Grace. She is the author of America is Infected. It's a true story talking about uh, her quest to rescue her son from the grips of the court system as well as discover just exactly what was the mystery disease that was taking over your family's life. Now, you were just getting into the discovery. So, take us there. It was shocking, to say the least. Um, it was my son and myself that seemed to be the most symptomatic, but I did notice some symptoms in two children that I had adopted, we had adopted. And that's when I just realized there was something contagious, something was spreading. It was, uh, I didn't know what it was. And my son had been tested for literally everything under the sun. So I did have extensive lab work to look at, even though I didn't really know what I was looking at. I did Google every single word. <laughs> and I did notice that, or I was told he had an active mycoplasma infection. So I launch into mycoplasma. And I'm like, what's mycoplasma? Yeah, it's supposed it. to be walking pneumonia. That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be this relatively benign bacteria. The interesting thing is it's a very small genome. I think it's like 464 genes. It's the smallest. And when I figured out that there was nobody doing mycoplasma research in America other than Dr. Nicholson, I really didn't have many other options when I delved into the research. And what I found and learned rang so true with what had happened in our family. I cried for three days. I learned that in the Texas prison systems back in the early 1980s, they were testing with uh, bioweapons, basically. Wow. There is a patent for this organism, and it is pathogenic mycoplasma mm -hmm. filed by the United States Army Pathology head researcher in 1993. And not only is it this bacteria, but it's been genetically modified to be more heat resistant, more immunosuppressive, and more virulent, also resistant to antibiotics. And uh, the worst thing is they have woven some of the genes of some retroviruses into the DNA of the mycoplasma bacteria. So it is like a Russian doll. Wow. I have enough education to have been literally terrified when I realized we were infected with a bioweapon. Cried for three days, and I thought, oh my God, please, you, you know, there's nobody that's going to be able to help us. And so I just kept looking and reading, and I did find a treatment protocol. It explained everything. Dr. Nicholson explained everything about this organism. Why, when my son went on antibiotics and then he came off, he got worse again. Why airplanes made us worse. Why... Um, chemicals in our food make us worse. All these things, there's a reason for that. It's because we are infected with this intracellular organism that has been genetically modified, and most of us don't even know what's wrong with us. And nobody's gonna be able to help us unless we empower ourselves and we know how to tell them how to help us. Wow, and isn't it always just so interesting when there is some 
uh, Zika virus or Ebola and this and that, you can always go back and see that some sort of governmental institution has a patent on it. And that is the thing that is just so bizarre to me. We know that they deal in bioweapons. They've been working on it for quite some time. Um, I'm just going to read something out of the Journal of Degenerative Diseases. This is Dr. Nicholson uh, talking about it, where he says, in the case of prisoners as experimental subjects, Texas has a long history of using prisoners for clinical trials. According to the minutes of the Texas Department of Corrections Board, selected prisons in East Texas were used for experiments that were conducted using various mycoplasma species to determine pathogenicity and countermeasures against infection. This likely resulted in the spread of mycoplasmal illnesses from prisoners to guards and other prison employees and then their immediate family members in the community. So is, is that what rang true? Is that, uh, how, did, how are you introduced to these? That's what rang true and I, I read the story, I read the story and I was like, that's it because nothing else made any sense. I was thinking it was a bacterial phage, which did is like- Did you have a family member in the prison system? We had a family member, right, that was down here in the Texas prison systems about that time. And I was able to look at the medical records and figure out exactly when we were infected. You can either get, it was 2002 when it happened, we were directly invaded. You can either be directly invaded with this organism, in which time you get, which case you get really sick. Like with a flu that you just can't get better from. It's like seven to nine days, nine to 12 days. I mean, I remember we were deathly sick. Or you can contract it slowly over time with 24 casual exposures. So say you work with someone or, mm -hmm. you know, you, you live with someone, you slowly contract it. When those people contract it, the symptoms don't seem to be as virulent as when someone is directly invaded. And so at that point, 2002, when we trace everything back, you can start to slowly see the evolution of the symptoms. And I'm just going to say ADHD was huge, night terrors, separation anxiety, um, sinus infections, headaches, nightmares, um, and then it progressed to joint pain. But we never put it together because they're so scattered that you just, one thing pops up, you go get that looked at, it's taken care of, but yeah. it's the same And organism. this is an explosion of all of these, uh, all of these acronym type diseases people are dealing with throughout. I mean, this is, this is new and people are not really stopping to say, well, why does everyone have ADD and, you know, OCD and these types of things now? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then you're thinking all these other problems like finances or it's my marriage or it's my children or it's, the, I mean, just whatever. You're blaming everything else, not realizing what the actual root is. Wow. And then so you really get into the nitty gritty. I mean, I've got the patent right here for pathogenic mycoplasma uh, filed June 6, 1991, after, of course, they do a series of clinical trials to see, you know, countermeasures, things like that. You can always find these patents. Um, now, you really get into this in your book, uh, America is Infected. So talk to me a little bit more about the book. How can people learn more about what is next? You know, I'm really excited about this because I think it is time that this information gets out. I mean, Dr. Nicholson tried to tell him back in 1998, he went in front of the Senate committees. You cannot find it by blood. You have to find it by polymerase chain reaction testing. At that point in time, for whatever reason, they did not listen. But just like you said, there is an explosion. Everyone knows there is something, they just don't know what it is. Um, I'm not really an author, <laughs> but when I found this out, I said, I'm gonna figure out how to write a book because I've gotta tell people this is just so, such a travesty. But on my Facebook page, on the Pandas Facebook page, I'm like, I'm gonna write a book. And then all of a sudden, go, you need an editor. So an editor just falls into my life. And this is how this works also with my agent, Dr. Stuckey. He has been working with me now to get this information out. We're working on the website. You can actually buy the book by going to americaisinfected.com. I highly recommend reading it from beginning to end. Like I've heard from moms, chapters one through 11 give me PTSD, but it's very chaotic. I mean, but it's reminiscent of so many lives today. And then you'll see how I start to figure things out. I documented all the doctor's visits, what they said to me, my questions to them, how I recorded things. I also really get into depth about the juvenile court systems and how corrupt they are and how if a doctor doesn't even recognize this, how can a social worker or a DCS make the decisions to tear families apart when doctors don't even know about this infection, it's completely unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Right. And it, it also makes a lot of sense of why 
they would want a controversial topic like this to stay under the radar and just tell you that you're crazy, you're crazy, and we need to take your kid away. And by the way, we're going to put him on all sorts of other medications for psych meds because he's crazy too. Meanwhile, this is actually happening. They're actually dealing on with bioweapons in the prison system and elsewhere, a lot of times in the foster care system and with these kids who don't have a parental unit making sure that they're not being used in clinical trials and things. But this this type of stuff is really going on. Right, and it right. does take someone like you who really cares and who isn't going to allow themselves to be gaslighted and told that, you know, you're crazy, this doesn't exist, in order to bring these things to light. And, of course, to have doctors and things like that who aren't afraid to speak out because who knows what else is out there. I mean, this is one patent that we're dealing with in one small Texas prison. Mm -hmm. just, I mean, it's mm -hmm. just what's out there is inc crazy to me. So people can go to AmericaIsInfected.com. Yes. Is that is there any other websites or um, buy the book for sure? Mm -hmm. Just buy the book there or read the book. Buy five copies for your friends and family. Anyone that has any symptoms, just give them the information. Just tell them. I will say the treatment is in the patent the inventor would know the right treatment. So the treatment is in the patent. Also, there's protocol on Dr. Nicholson's website that, that we actually followed for our whole family. By the way, did I mention we actually found it in our dog? The dog got treatment too. Everyone's doing much better. Yeah. So there I is I mean, this hope. is airborne thing. So this is something that a lot of people might be dealing with that they don't even know. And meanwhile, they're going to pump you full of all the drugs that you don't really need that aren't going to help you. Well, Ella, thank you so much for what you've written here and what you've done for this country, really. So go out and buy the book, America is Infected, at americaisinfected.com. Joining me in studio now is our investigative journalist, Kit Daniels. Kit, now you've got a story coming out of the EU. This is something we've talked about for years. And once again, they're proposing this, and they might actually get their chance this time around because of all the terrorism that they've been importing, of course, order out of chaos. So this is, once again, EU proposing the government ID to access the Internet. Yeah, exactly. This is just the government using the guise of anything that they they want to push into, you know, total tyranny. It's like you said, though, of course, they're going to use, they let in all the uh, Muslim migrants into, the, into the Europe, you know, then the, all of a sudden they have bombings and what have you, but they still won't close any of the borders. And now, yeah, it's like, well, it's, well, just, it's the new normal. Yeah. Terrorism. Yeah. It's the new normal terrorism, just like you said. And the new normal is to take away the rights of the citizens, but not the terrorists. Because the terrorists are these useful patsies that they can use to bring in a complete police state. Yeah. And so this is obviously something that's going to be uh, eradicating both online privacy as well as free speech. People are already likening it to the mark of the beast. And we have seen this being proposed for years. Uh, there was actually the Bilderberg it, back in 2012, we're pushing for mandatory Internet ID for Europe. And I know that you all did some reporting on this in 2014 about how the White House was wanting to push Chinese-style ID system for Internet users. So what would this look like? Well, going back like 15 years ago, even 20 years ago, back in the infancy of the Internet, so to speak, you, know, you didn't have that many people using it. You could go on there anonymously and go on a Usenet group or whatnot and post your thoughts, opinions on everything without fear of public backlash because no one knew who you were. You, it was a, literally a digital Guy Fox mask. And now when Facebook came around, I think 2004, they started conditioning people into using their real names and they're using their real photos and whatnot. And now what you have is Facebook and Twitter, it's got maybe a third of the internet now mm -hmm. as far as the traffic. So it's like Matt Drudge said back in October, it's a complete internet ghetto. Right. Now, I even go further than that. It's, a complete, it's turned into a virtual super state. Right. Just kind of like the Holy Roman Empire, except it's all digital. Mm. So instead, and of course, they don't want people being anonymous in their little virtual super state because when, you're, when you are not anonymous, you fear backlash of exactly. spreading your opinion. So it's a complete channeling effect on free speech. Right, and we've already started to see that now that people understand that they're being tracked on Facebook and these others. Facebook app on your phone can be listening to you at all times. They, it's just to sell you targeted advertising, but of course, that's what they say right now. Who knows where it could go? Uh, we also have a story coming out now that the uh, police and FBI are wanting uh, Android to turn over all of their location tracking. Mm -hmm. So if you have that turned on your phone, which a lot of people don't understand, when you get your phone, it's all set up to heavily track you and surveil you. You have to turn all of these things off. And now the police are filing warrants saying, give us the location data so that we can start 
putting putting people where they were when certain things happened, and they really are building uh, the minority report as we speak all around us. Yeah, it's like I said in so many videos, is that the government can only expand at the expense of individual liberties. And the government, especially government officials, they always want more and more power. But there's never going, they're never going to hit a line that's going to stop them from gaining more power. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to see is more draconianism, more authoritarianism. So, yeah, it's like exactly, they're just going to treat people like cattle. That, you know, they want to track people. They really don't even have a reason to track yeah. people. I mean, when you think about it. They want to control. They're obsessed with controlling every single aspect of our life to the point now that they're putting out these propaganda campaigns on mainstream media about how great it is to microchip your kids. Because then they won't get kidnapped and they won't get stolen. Yeah, and, and see, that's, that's how they're the going to sell it. And that's the other thing is the fact that they, uh, when they suppress other people's speech by not allowing them to go online and talk, you know, freely, then, then they can put out whatever propaganda they want. Right. Because they have no counter argument or their little sock puppets will pop up in all the chat rooms. I mean, they've got all the bases covered at this point. And let's just point out this this article that came out uh, earlier this week about the French officials who were able to do a secret tax raid on the Google offices there so that they could say, hey, you know, you owe us billions in taxes mm -hmm. for setting up shop here. Well, the only way that they were able to do that was by going completely offline. They had one PC that they had in their um, station that was only accessing like the word processor. So mm -hmm. they went completely offline for over a year. They weren't even allowed to utter the words Google just in case their phone was listening to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. They had to give it a secret code name. So this is, you know, this is really interesting that they're going to have all of us being tracked and surveilled at every, at every movement, yet they know that they're going to have to go underground to be kind of incognito and to get around the big eye of Sauron that's Google. So even mm -hmm. now, you know, your state officials are, are having to kind of figure out how to get around this. Yeah, it's complete hypocrisy, but when you think about it, total control comes from hypocrisy because the government wants the dominant position. So, of course, they're going to do something that they don't want you to do. Mm. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit about why this is so bizarre that we would want to give the government the ability to microchip us and or ask for their permission in order to access the internet. Um, it's super scary when you think about Elon Musk saying, become cyborgs or risk human beings being turned into robots, pets. Mm -hmm. So he's saying the only way that we're going to be able to uh, be smarter than the AI, the super AI that's on its way, is if we ourselves get these brain chip implants and are able to instantly access the internet and all of that. But the fact is, the internet is going to be whatever that brain chip allows us to access. Who's in control of the internet? Who's in control of wherever we're allowed to uh, to access? Yeah, exactly. And like I was telling you before the show, I think he spent, what, a billion dollars or something like that to uh, fi find ways to fight the uh, coming AI war. But it's like AI is still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, <laughs> yeah. so why don't we just pull the plug now? Exactly. And it's they cannot help themselves. What do you think about he also said that we uh, Elon Musk said we're living in a computer simulation uh, that if if we're not, there's only a one in billions chance that we're not living in a computer simulation. And now I've been <laughs> saying this for a long time. It seems very weird. We've seen, of course, this theory in the Matrix as well. Yeah, this is something that I've been very interested in in the past year. The fact that what I kind of disagree with when it comes to atheism is they think that we live in the base reality. But I kind of think that the universe lives in a superstructure, if you will. And I think, uh, I think it was back in April when these uh, University of Vienna, I think, uh, physicists, they freaked out because they realized all their mathematical models work better if the universe was a hologram. Like if it's a 2D, but you and me, we see it as a 3D object. So, you know, it kind of gets to me, I crack a little bit because there's all this online debate over still if the, the earth is flat, flat, right? but maybe the universe is flat. Yeah. Oh my, uh, maybe we are a computer well, simulation, it, yeah. like just like the Sims characters, which now s update to the Sims, they have made it so that you can choose whatever kind of gender identity you like for the Sims. I mean, right. This They're basically saying that our reality is just a, a, grander version of the Sims. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I took a, a astronomy class in college, and one of the things I remember from the class was the fact that all the elements that you see in our solar system is anywhere in the universe. Right. So a galaxy hundreds of thousands of light years from here is still going to have carbon and argon and what have you. And it kind of reminds me of that video game Minecraft. You know, it was basically 
the game itself is like a sandbox game that's randomly generated world with lo blocks. You know, you've got sand blocks and iron blocks and air blocks and water blocks. And they say that one game world is like eight times the size of planet Earth. And this is just a video game. And th same thing with, with Elon Musk, what he said was the fact that 40 years ago, we only had Pong. And now we have games like Minecraft. So theoretically, we could get to a point where computer systems are so strong and powerful that we could recreate the universe. Right, where we're, we're creating we these the, simulated realities yeah. that are so realistic, we step back and go, wait a minute, what's the machine and what's real here? Yeah. Just like what they're ex expecting to happen with artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's going to go beyond what we can even comprehend at this point to where we are going to look at ourselves. I mean, if you think at our cellular structure, even our DNA, we are the and ultimate honestly, computer code. Yeah, and I think, honestly, this fits really well into Christianity because when they talk about souls, the soul could be our source code in the superstructure. Yeah. Or the fact that, I think it was Hubble that talked about how they used to read the Bible and then astronomy later on basically kind of correlated with what the Bible said. So, yeah, yeah you could think of God as... The supreme being that created the computer game yeah, while living exactly. in. <laughs> yeah, and there's a Dutch philosopher in this, I think the 17th century, I don't remember what his name is, it started with an S, but he pointed out that that God was kind of this infinite mind and that all of us were living in this infinite mind. That fits a lot into this whole computer simulation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is a fascinating topic to me, so I will definitely get you back in to speak about this. Thank you so much, Kit Daniels. And thank you all of you out there for tuning in tonight. We'll see you here again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.